Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Let's get started. Um, so Thomas Jefferson said that everyone has a right to pursue it. Uh, Ambrose Bierce said that we get it by contemplating the misery of our neighbors. And Bob Ross said that we should paint it onto little trees. Um, I'm so delighted to be here today uh, at AHS talking to you all about happiness. My name is Alex Baia. And um, so a lot of people have said a lot of different things about happiness, and here's what we're going to look at today. So first I'm going to give us a helpful philosophical distinction that will kind of sharpen up our thinking about happiness. Um, then I want to talk about the connection between happiness and health, which is especially pertinent to all of us. And um, after that, I want to talk about one sort of obstacle to happiness, one scary obstacle to happiness, which is cognitive bias. And then I want to say something about how we can sort of fuse empirical psychology and ancestral health to understand happiness better, and maybe, if we're lucky, maybe be a little bit happier. OK, so uh, here's an important and helpful distinction. We can talk about happiness as a state of mind, aka uh, psychological happiness, or we can talk about happiness as uh, a life that goes well, aka what you might call well-being or flourishing. So in the first sense, happiness is something that's subjective. It concerns a mental state. Uh, to be happy is just for things to be, to be a certain way to me subjectively. Um, in the second sense, right, it's about value. It's about fundamentally what is good for a person. To, so to say that someone is happy in that sense is to say that they're flourishing or their life is going well. It's a value judgment. So how do we use happiness or happiness in natural language? Well, we use it in both ways. So I might say, Jared is so happy right now. That's something about his mental state. Or I might say, Jared lives an interesting and happy life. That's kind of a value judgment about how he's living a life of flourishing or well-being. Things are going well for him. Um, so there's this kind of mistake that people make sometimes to assume that happiness must be one particular thing. Uh, we don't have to make that mistake. So here's a nice thought experiment that will help us a little bit. There are these super duper neuropsychologists that have designed this experience machine that can give you any experience that your heart desires. So you can hook up to the machine and it'll simulate any experience whatsoever. You can hook up and have an experience of skiing the Alps and winning a gold medal, writing a great novel, flying a spaceship to Mars, or you could do something really lame. So the point is, you're not really doing these things. You're just experiencing them, right? You're there in the machine having this experience. And subjectively, it's totally indistinguishable from really doing these things. Um, but of course, you're not really doing these things. You're just hooked up to the machine. So let's assume that these super duper neuropsychologists could give you whatever experiences you wanted for the rest of your life. Uh, would you, how many of you, just raise your hand if you would plug into the experience machine for the rest of your life? Any, anyone brave, you can have any life you want. Absolutely no one at all would plug into the experience machine. OK, so here's something we might learn from that little thought experiment. You responded just the way that I wanted you to. Um, so right, happiness in that first sense is distinct from happiness in that second. We can be psychologically very happy, right? We can be in some mental state, and we wouldn't say that we're necessarily flourishing. When we're there in the machine, we have that great sense of, Wow, you know, I just won the Nobel Prize. But we wouldn't say life is going well for you because you're just a blob hooked up to a machine. Um, the other thing you might take away from that is we might care about more than just happiness. It's not the only thing that matters uh, in life, although it does matter. So finally, one thing to note about it, happiness is something that we can say it has intrinsic value. Um, it's not just a means to an end. If someone says to us, some cranky person says, you're happy, so what? Why is that good? That's just kind of a daft thing to say, right? Um, that person is just cranky, probably. OK, so in case you still don't care, why health lovers should love happiness. So it's been shown convincingly, happier people live longer and have better health. So there's this really interesting research that's been done by uh, Ed Diener and others. Uh, he's a positive psychologist. And he's shown pretty convincingly, to my mind, that happiness actually causes longevity and happiness actually protects against illness. Um, 
So in his studies, happiness means life satisfaction, optimism, and experiencing a lot of positive emotions. And so in these studies, he looks at a couple of different kinds. He looks at an observational study where you take a group of people uh, of similar ages and similar levels of health at baseline. You follow them through life, and you see that the ones that are happier live longer. Um, and they also have less illness. And then the other type of study looks at what we know about how positive mental states actually affect physiology. And they impact physiology in various helpful ways. And so when you combine that evidence together, you get pretty strong evidence of those two things. Um, this is pretty interesting. Having a lot of happiness adds at least as many years to your life as does quitting smoking. So according to Wienhoven, the evidence that happiness extends life is even stronger than the evidence that obesity shortens it. That's pretty surprising. It's pretty strong. Okay, here's something that's not surprising. Uh, when we're in poor health, that's obviously gonna rob us of happiness, right? When you're very ill, uh, you experience more negative emotions, you're more preoccupied with your own problems, and you have less time to enjoy life's pleasures. So health and happiness, what's the connection? The causal arrow goes both ways. Health causes happiness, happiness causes health. Um, that's why I think ancestral health approach is very promising. Uh, Right, because it offers us this self-reinforcing spiral of better happiness and better health. It says, eat a variety of plants and animals, uh, manage your stress, sleep well, move, and be happier and healthier. That's a good thing. Okay, let's look at one big, big, scary, frightening obstacle to happiness, cognitive bias. So it turns out uh, that human brains are better at learning from negative or bad experiences than they are at learning uh, from positive or good experiences. We might call this negativity bias. So we spend more of our cognitive resources and more of our attention on things that harm us than on things that help us. Here's one example of that. We more quickly recognize uh, negative, angry, fearful facial expressions and we pay more attention to them. That's just one example. Here's another interesting example, uh, loss aversion. So this one is, this one is pretty, pretty crazy when you really think about it. So we actually prefer avoiding losses to acquiring gains. So to most people, experiencing a loss of $100 causes more pain than a gain of $100 causes pleasure, right? So we're more, people will expend more effort, they'll expend all this irrational effort to save $5, but they won't expend it to earn $5, which when you think about it, it's just, it's just kind of crazy. Um, these are just two ways of illustrating this orientation that our brains have towards harmful, negative things, towards losses. Uh, so as neuropsychologist Hansen says, the soil of your brain is more fertile for weeds than flowers. Um, why do we have negativity bias? Here's one idea. So the womb of our brain, which is our ancestral past, was a very brutal and unforgiving place. In the ancestral past, uh, one of our hunter-gatherer ancestors faced a very high cost of uh, misperceiving a dangerous situation, right? If our hunter-gatherer hears something behind him and, you know, doesn't turn around or maybe just says, eh, I'll check it out later, uh, that's probably not going to be a good thing. That might result in death, okay? On the other hand, the cost of misperceiving something beneficial uh, might be a lost meal, but it usually wasn't death. Um, so some people are skeptical of these evolutionary explanations. To them, I say, ho-hum, it's interesting, I find it plausible, uh, but we don't need the evolutionary explanation. We can just point out that these negativity biases are very well confirmed in psychology. That'll do for present purposes. Um, one other thing that I'll mention really quick, because it's important, it's distinct, uh, but it does have an effect on happiness, is confirmation bias, which probably a lot of people are familiar, who's familiar with, with you've heard this term before, I assume a lot of people have. So the idea is that we're more likely to seek uh, and to, to pay attention to, to give credence for things that support our belief system rather than things to oppose it. So here's my example of this. Uh, you can try to convince Chef Boyardee to go paleo, but it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, so it's hard for people to accept data that right discords with their worldview. Okay, so one of the reasons this is bad is, I mean, if you've ever known someone who has some habit that's clearly harmful to their health, harmful to their happiness, it's like obvious to you, it's obvious to people around them, 
yet they persist in that, confirmation bias is partly to thank. Okay, so now I want to talk about negativity bias in action, an interesting, uh, an interesting case that I think helps illustrate it. So to me, one of the very interesting examples of this is the mainstream news, um, AKA what grown rational adults believe is happening out there in the world. Lots of italics and exclamation points. So I did this completely unbiased, not at all cherry picked, just grab the CNN headlines one day, put them up, and uh, here are some of my favorite. This is from some day in July. So we've got such great headlines as SWAT team storms jet grabs passenger, patient doctor cut off my manhood. Intruder, I'm pregnant. Man, I shot her. 551 pound convict, end house arrest. And probably my favorite one is volleyball player too attractive. So out of these 19 headlines, 14 are definitely negative. Only one is positive. Um, does anyone really think that this paints an accurate picture of what's going on in the world out there? So if you pay attention to the news, you might think the world is full of war, right? It's full of disaster. It's full of death and destruction on a mass scale. But of course, in reality, the world is also full of growing businesses and thriving partnerships. It's Home Depot and Samsung hooking, hooking up a nice partnership there. Um, performances that enchant the senses. That's Yanni. I recommend him. And meals that delight our palates. Look at how happy they are. Um, right, so the point isn't to harp on the news media. The point is that I see this as a kind of dark microcosm of our cognitive and attentional biases. It offers a glimpse into how we fixate on the negative, we obsess about it, we, our brains kind of irrationally view it as more important, as more significant, and it gives us this message, oh, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, I can't control it, there's nothing I can do, everyone is going to die. Um, how to deal with bias? Well, awareness is the first step, but it's not enough. Research has shown that you can be aware of your own biases and still be biased but it is the first step. Uh, the second step, I would say, is develop mental techniques to deal with bias. Mindfulness and meditation are very, have been shown to be very effective at allowing us to direct our attention and give us an awareness of where our mind is at. And then third, uh, just be aware, being aware of the triggers in our life. So being aware of the objects, the circumstances, and the people that trigger certain things in our mind and structuring our lives accordingly. Is the point that we should have no negative emotions? No, of course not. That would be impossible and extremely foolish in various ways. The point is to be aware of our own minds and to be aware of what's triggering these things. Okay, so uh, positive psychology and ancestral health, how can they give us a glimpse into a happier life? So we can start by saying, what are the characteristics of a happy human being besides good health, which we already know? Um, there's been a ton of work done on this, and there's too much stuff to get into, but here are two really interesting ones. Um, so psychologists have studied this extensively. They found a couple of major themes. Actually, they found a lot of major themes, but here are two of my favorites. So one is that happy people utilize their individual character strengths to foster their work, their hobbies, and their social relationships. So utilize your character strengths to foster your work, your hobbies, and your social relationships. And another theme is that happy people become absorbed in the present moments of their work, their hobbies, and their lives so that they experience a state of flow. Um, a state of flow being a state where you are absorbed in the present moment, you're absorbed in the here and now of your experience, you're not thinking of other places or other people, you're absorbed in it, you're just sort of flowing. Okay, so combine this with ancestral health. I think there's an interesting analogy here, right? Conventional medicine and psychology are negatively oriented. They're concerned with treating disease and disorder. So the ethos is something like this. Wait until you break, it will happen, and we'll fix you with pills, with surgeries, with treatments. But positive psychology and ancestral health, on the other hand, have this sort of positively oriented ethos, right? Positive psychology says there's more to mental health than the absence of mental illness. And ancestral health says there's more to physical health than the absence of disease. 
So on the one hand, we say embrace the things that make you positively flourish and that make you happy. And on the other hand, we say embrace the things that nourish you uh, and give you vitality. So nourishment to the ancestral approach is uh, to give ourselves the right nutrients, right? And so we can list all these examples of micronutrients from colorful plants, essential fats and proteins, uh, good bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. And the psychologist who studies happiness wants to, wants to say nourish ourselves with the right lifestyle nutrients, right? So work and hobbies and relationships that leverage our character strengths, activities that promote flow, deep friendships, and some other things that I don't have time to talk about. I think one very example, very good example of the way these things uh, come together is in play. So in play, uh, it's a very pure expression of our creativity um, and our autonomy and our sense of flow. When we are in the right state, when we're playing, we harness our physical and mental strengths and we get into a state of flow. So for example, this guy is definitely harnessing his strengths, his uh, vitality, his persistence, his physical strength. Do you think he cares about other stuff that's happening in the world or like, you know, negative things like, oh God, there are wars going on. No, he's just happy, he's flowing, right? So there are a lot of good ways to play. Playing with movement is fantastic. One of my favorites is playing with theatrical improvisation. Um, you can play with whatever this is. <laughs> so there are a lot of ways to play. You can play with writing, you can play with music, art, sports, games, socializing. Uh, find, find the way that you want to play or the ways. So I think we all have this inner drive to create things, to be playful, to be in a state of flow. I think it's absolutely a mistake. I think it's a completely dangerous and insidious mistake to say that play is only for kids or only people who are artsy or creative. Uh, it leads to this kind of situation from one of my favorite comics. I'll just let you look at that for five seconds. And I think anyone who looks at that, they go, oh yeah, I get it. Okay, so I'm gonna close by saying, uh, telling someone to pursue happiness, that's pretty mysterious. Uh, if I just tell you to pursue happiness, it'll actually probably make you sadder. Because you'll go, I don't know how to do that. Or you might try and you'll, and you'll just, you'll be like, well, what should I do? So what I would say is that the better thing is to, is to actually be more specific and to say, understand your own mind, understand your own biases, uh, nourish yourself, nourish your body, use your character strengths uh, to create things, do what puts you into a state of flow. Those are just some suggestions that are very well proven. And when we fuse ancestral health and empirical psychology about happiness, we get this really nice framework of understanding our own mind, nourishing ourselves, and playing. That's a nice start. Again, it's not everything, but it's a nice start. And so I hope I've convinced you that that offers a, f a promising framework. So go take away one thing from this, maybe, maybe play more, maybe understand your own biases, and uh, go do something awesome. That's it. Are we, so we're out of time here, or are we taking a minute for questions, or? Uh, yes, a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes for questions. Uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I certainly don't want to advocate like living in a... Oh yeah, she was asking, well, if, you, if news media is so negative, what if you want to affect social change? You have a job involving that maybe. You want to promote good in the world and not just within your own circle. Um, what, do you, what do you do? How do you reconcile those two things? So I think it's a fantastic question. I'm not advocating that everyone live in a sort of like happy parochial bubble, um, you know. I myself try to just not look at the news at all because I just don't need to and it doesn't help me. So I just don't do it. 
I'm still here. Um, but I recognize that some people need to, and so I, I would say that's fine. Yeah, I mean, if it's for your job or you need to, the only thing I would really say is recognize what parts of it you need and what parts of it you don't. I, I don't really have anything more to say than that other than, yep, that's a completely, that's, you know, a completely fine point in that some people will have it for their jobs, and if you do, just recognize it for what it is. Um, yeah, right there. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I think, do we have time for one more? No. We are out of time. <laughs>